Okay, okay, okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank y'all so much for joining us. Attention, please. Uh, my name is Daniel Oyolu. I am a program coordinator here at the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, we're so excited you could be here to join us. Just a couple of event reminders and announcements. Um, so next week, our lunch will be Technology, Disruption, and the Practice of Law. Will the profession survive? With Raj Goyal and Ari Shahadi. Um, and December 2nd, we also have an event coming up from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Algorithms, Law, and Society, Building Rights for a Digital Era. Um, if you'd like more information on either of these events, you could go online to our webpage, cyber.harvard.edu slash events. Um, and lastly, this event is being live webcast, recorded, so um, be mindful you are being recorded. And if you don't want to be recorded, well, okay. And without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Berkman Center senior researcher, Ryan Budish, to introduce our speaker. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for fighting your way through the crowd of law students uh, to, uh, to join us here today. Who would have thought that uh, a week and a half after a presidential election, a bunch of law students would be interested in discussing executive power, apparently, so uh, big surprise there. But, uh, but we know that we have uh, uh, the more interesting uh, conversation here with uh, Scott Bradner. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, if you would like to, uh, to tweet uh, about this, uh, you can use the hashtag uh, BKCHarvard. Um, and so, uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Scott. You know, uh, uh, Internet governance has been something that uh, the Berkman Klein Center uh, has been uh, interested in and worked uh, in for quite some time. Uh, going back to uh, some of the original ICANN meetings uh, to then in 2010, uh, heading up the accountability and transparency review team, uh, and then most recently uh, uh, being a part of an expert panel that uh, helped the NTIA uh, assess the uh, most recent um, news about the IANA transition. Uh, and that proposal. So uh, this is something that that, that Berkman Klein uh, thinks is a very important uh, issue. And so we're really pleased to have Scott <coughs> here uh, talk about uh, IANA uh, and why it's important, uh, uh, but not for what they do. Uh, Scott Bradner was involved in the design, operation, and use of data networks at Harvard University since the early days of the ARPANET. This included designing the Longwood Medical Area Network and the New England Academic and Research Network. He was founding chair of the technical committees for these networks as well as the Corporation for Research and Enterprise Network. Scott has served in a number of different roles in the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the network of engineers that developed the protocols that helped the internet run and function. Uh, he was also elected trustee of the Internet Society, where he was vice president for standards and secretary to the board of trustees. Scott recently retired from Harvard University in 2016 after 50 years working in the areas of computer programming, system management, networking, IT security, and identity management. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Scott. So good afternoon. So we're going to talk about the IANA. Well, let's start off talking about silliness, absurdity. Mr. Mr. Cruz there, he's a bright kid. He's a Harvard boy, Harvard Law School. But he was remarkably stupid in this. He, he created a, a persona that the internet was going to end. And these are some of the headlines that showed up. The little, the, this eagle down in the lower left-hand corner is off of his website, a special website he set up to talk about the evils of this transition of the IANA going off and doing something. States sued. Uh, Obama gives away the Internet, and with it, our liberty. Um, the federal judge just let Obama give away the Internet seven days before Obama gives away the Internet and national security. All of that is complete hooey. Um, we're being videotaped, so I can't really tell you what I think. 
But, so let's go back a little bit. I'm going to go back and forth a couple of times here. Let's go, let's go back a bit to the beginning. This whole IANA thing started with a need to coordinate. Okay. So this uh, whole IANA thing started with a need to coordinate information. Not to control information, but to coordinate it. Uh, started with a network, an ad hoc network research group, which sort of wanted to figure out what to do with a uh, ARPANET that was about to be deployed. And then uh, the series of requests for comments on talking about different technologies or different proposals for technology. A fellow named John Postel, then a graduate student, took on the job of being series editor. And then he took, a few years later, took on the job of coordinating what were then the identifiers of different types of communication over the ARPANET, which was the socket numbers. The concept, the, the name IANA, showed up many years later in 1988, although the function that was there from 1972 on, uh, the, the actual name showed up in 88. So it, coordinating more than just sockets. Coordinating IP addresses, internet protocol addresses, when IP addresses started to be handed out. Uh, the IP addresses turned out to be a little hard to use. I don't tell you to uh, send mail to me at 128.103.836, which, which is the IP address of the computer that used to be at my desk in uh, William James Hall. Uh, so we come up with this inner indirection called the domain name system. And somebody has to coordinate that. Um, there's a root, the root service, the .com, .net, .org. The hierarchy there is, makes things easier. So all of the parts of what is today's IANA were in place in, by 1984. All of those different pieces of it by 1984. Um, but let's go back again to the beginning. Once upon a time, computers were expensive and big. My uh, iPhone is about the power of uh, the, those large computers that took up buildings back in the, uh, in the late 60s. The federal government could not afford to give every institution their own computer. So they wanted to share it. And the Defense Department was, uh, had a lot of researchers out there doing research. And they wanted to share these computers because they couldn't give each one, each of the researchers their own computer. So they decided to build a network to share those, share those computers. The network was a packet-based network. It was a packet-based network in that, uh, that you broke the data up into chunks, and the chunks fiddle, th fiddle through the network to get to the destination. The concept of this came, was done by Paul Barron back in the uh, early 60s and at RAND. He was off trying to figure out a way to build a network that would survive a <laughs> strike nuclear attack. Because he figured that if we could, if the communications would exist after a nuclear, first strike nuclear attack, then the enemy would feel, think twice about hitting a first strike because we could retaliate. But he also wanted to give that same technology to the Russians so that we would think first, think about doing first strike. But it was, the, it was that technology, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was to share the big computers. So ARPA went off and they built a network. They built a network out of this packet switch networking, switched networking. Um, each of those chunks of data trundling through the network has enough information to make it to the destination. That's a destination address. And it contains some data that it wants to transport. It makes no assumptions as to the underlying network's capabilities. It may, packets may be lost, duplicated, um, put out of order, anything. It just it doesn't know, it doesn't care. That, that is a pro, that's an issue for the end systems to deal with, not the network itself. No service guarantees. There's nothing here. It's just, I send you some packet, a bit, packet of bits, and it gets to you, maybe. And that's all. That's, that's what the, the, this network was. So the ARPA built a network. 69 were the first nodes. By uh, 82, there was a couple of hundred nodes, international. Um, then shortly thereafter, commercial networks showed up, started to show up. And by the mid-90s, we had a significant number of commercial networks. Uh, in late 90s, we had commercial networks all over the world. The interconnected mesh of those networks made the internet. That is the internet. It's that interconnected mesh. It wasn't the ARPANET. ARPANET was a separate network. But when the ARPANET moved over to TCPIP, 
and interconnected with these other networks, that became the internet. But no one cared. No one in the power structure, that is. The traditional networking people said, this doesn't work. There's no guarantees. There's no service guarantees, no reliability guarantees, no quality guarantees. Why would anybody use this? It's a toy. It's irrelevant. It is completely and utterly irrelevant. And that was great for us who were playing around in the network. Uh, but IBM refused to bid on the, the switches that made up the original ARPANET. Uh, they also said in 1992, quote, you cannot build a corporate data network out of TCP IP, end of quote. That's a direct quote from an IBM researcher. That's because their definition of a network was entirely different. It was a heavily controlled, heavily regulated, heavily managed network where everything was guaranteed. And the internet had none of that. Digital equipment went off and built their own protocol. Um, AT&T just refused to be involved in this at all. They just thought this was silly and irrelevant. Just like the aerodynamic theoreticians that said the bumblebees couldn't fly, the powers that be said the internet couldn't fly. And that was great because that meant that the regulators ignored us. Because this was never going to be of any value, why do we need to regulate it? Why do we need to think about how to control it? How to manage it from a governmental point of view? We don't have to because it's never going to amount to anything. Well, it kind of did amount to something. We'll get back to that. The IANA function went into a steady state around that time. And for, for a decade, was just basically just plunking along. Nothing really special. Sending out, uh, doing coordination of protocol parameters for the IETF, uh, doing some address allocations to regional registries. They didn't even do the allocations to the end systems. To like, when I got addresses for Harvard, I sent a note to John Postel, said, I need addresses. And he sent me back a note, said, here they are. Um, but very quickly after that, it was got delegated to regional registries around the world. So Diana only gave out big chunks of addresses to the regional registries. And, but the IANA ran the DNS top level. It was the database which pointed to the computers that ran each of the top level domains. That's what the IANA did. Uh, in uh, our, March 2000, uh, 1994, John Postel wrote a RFC, RFC 1591, in which he said, there's a small set of top level domains, and it's extremely unlikely that any other top level domains be created. So this is all the internet needs for coordination. There are only these few centralized functions. Everything in the internet is cooperation. It's you and I agreeing to use the same standard for email, for email transport. You and I agreeing to use the same standard for web, web display. There's no protocol police out there saying you have to do that. It's just if you and I disagree on which one to use, it ain't going to interoperate. And it's not going to get as profitable as it could be. But it is, there's, no, there's no requirements, no coordination, no nothing other than that le very simple level. So the only centralized functions are we have to agree on what the protocol parameters are. When I send you a packet, it has a field in there that says protocol. When I put a 25 in there, you have to know that means email. When I put an 80 in there, you have to know that means web. That's, there's, no, there's no requirement that you have to use it. It's just that in order for you to interpret the packet when you get it, you have to, we have to do that. So it's one central place where that's recorded. That's the IANA. We have to have some distributed, cons consistent way to distribute IP addresses because IP addresses have to be globally unique because they're telling you how to get to and what is the node that you're trying to get to and what is your address and saying who you are in a globally unique way. Those have to be globally unique. There are alternatives that people have thought about, but at the moment, that's the way it's set up. And that's done by the IANA. The coordinated, the top level is done by the IANA. And we have to have a single DNS at the moment. Again, there are different there are theories, ways you can get around that. But at the moment, there needs to be one definition of saying, here are the top level domains. So when you go to Ford.com, you get to the same Ford.com as your mother gets to when she drives it from her house. Uh, but that's it. 
That's the only thing we need to coordinate in the, the actually centralized management in the internet. Everything else is distributed. It's Harvard runs a piece of its DNS, um, MIT does, Ford does. Everybody runs their own little piece and they cooperate. All of the internet service providers cooperate, they interconnect with each other, but it's a business decision on how to interconnect, when to interconnect. It's entirely their own. There's nothing requiring it, no governance, no management. And then the proverbial turd hit the rotating device. Uh, the NSF said that uh, NSI could start charging for domain names. Up until, up until then, there were free registrations. I, free as in the government paid for them. But in 1995, September 95, the NSF said, okay, you can start selling these domain names. A fee of $100 for two years, 50 bucks a year. This was big. This was money. It was about 100 million uh, domain dot com names at that time. So that's 50 bucks a year for 100 million names. That's real money. And there's money to be minted here because, but Verizon, but uh, VeriSign's network solutions is the only game in town. So what do we do? Uh, there were some individual country codes that sort of saw their, hand, their money on the wall and went after it, like Tuvalu with .tv, and they sold, they, they leased out their country identity to a company in, I think, Canada to sell off to sell off domain names and .tv. So, but other, there was, this was big. It really got everybody pretty excited. The IANA has three functions. It's got the domain names, the IP addresses, the protocol parameters. The only one that makes any difference to anybody is domain names. Because that's where the money and the lawyers and the trademarks and all that kind of stuff are. Uh, you can't get away from the fact that this is awful stuff. It's an awful swamp, but it is the swamp that we've got. Um, it's also the only thing that the media can vaguely understand is their domain names. They talk about internet addressing, they mean domain names. It's not actual internet addressing, but they mean domain names. Their natural reaction to anybody mm -hmm. in the uh, capitalist society is, oh, there's a shortage, let's make more. So it's a lot of call for new top-level domains including from John Postel, proposed that. Uh, a number of us looked at that and said, it doesn't solve any real problem. If you're IBM.com, you're not going to move to IBM.fubar because you have to unwind the web and repoint everything. And you can't do that. So it's not really competition for existing registrations. It might be competition for new registrations, but the more, domain there's, the more domains there are, the more likely the only one you're going to remember is .com. So it really doesn't gain you much. But it, we need to do something because we have a monopoly. And monopolies are ugly and evil and all that kind of stuff. And so there needs to be something. John proposed to uh, move the, the control of the domain name system. And by the way, the other stuff that comes along with the IANA just because it was there, not because it made any difference, uh, to the Internet Society, which he was a board member of at the time, as I was. Uh, and they were going to set this up, an ad hoc group, to set up a, uh, a management for the domain name system under the Internet Society, doing it on their own. Not blessed by any governments. The, gov the U.S. government had been paying for the IANA function through I ISI, Internet, the um, University of Southern California, uh, for a number of years, up in, from, from the beginning. Uh, but he thought, well, let's just spin it off and set up our, set up our own, own, own separate organization within the Internet Society. And he set up an ad hoc, international ad hoc group, and it was an ad hoc group. We were representatives from a number of big, big groups like the NSF and the uh, World Intellectual Property Rights Organization, International Telecommunications Standards, and groups like that. But it was really an ad hoc group. It was doing something on their own. They had not been blessed by anybody to do it. They just went off and did it. Great idea. The idea was to come up with uh, seven new TLDs. What do you do? Seven new TLDs. But one of those TLDs was .web. And a, a company, or actually an individual, going under a company name of uh, the uh, Image Online Design, sued John over .web because he claimed that John had a verbal agreement to sell .web to him. 
Uh, John was not in the power position to actually sell any domain names at that time, the TLDs at that time, but the uh, Image Online Design said he did. He said he reneged on this. John later told me that this lawsuit and the lack of support he got out of ISI uh, in response to the lawsuit was a reason that he re-energized his activities to try and get the IANA off out of, under, out from under US government control and into a private organization because he felt very burnt. And also there was a redirection of the, uh, the route uh, by Eugene Kasparov who went to jail over it uh, to redirect to alternate. So there was, there was a lot of stuff at play. Department of Commerce, who was, had taken over the general management of the contract with ISI for the IANA functions, saw that we needed to do something. So they put out a uh, request for comments saying, we need to do something. Here's some ideas we've got. What do you think? And they want to set up mechanisms for domain name registration and management thereof. Now, they meant all of the IANA functions, but that's the only one they mentioned. Meanwhile, John had been proceeding to try and come up with a, a way to get the IANA function out into a private organization. He'd been working on that on his own and with a bunch of us uh, during that period, uh, a bunch in the IETF and elsewhere. Uh, he consulted with IRM Magaziner, who was responsible for the RFC out of the uh, Department of Commerce. And by the end of 1997, he had a plan. It was a plan for a, what he called institutionalizing the, R, the IANA function. And that was uh, sort of accumulated in, a, in January, the end of January 1998, uh, in a, a conference in, uh, in London called Reengineering the Internet. Uh, Ira Magaziner was a main speaker there. He said what the US government was going to do, sort of forecast forecast what they were going to do, which is to support the idea of spinning out the function, to not have it under ISI, but have it under a separate corporation. John didn't make it, so I presented it instead. I presented a paper, and you can see that on, the, on my website. Shortly after that, Magaziner and the Department of Commerce put out what they call the green paper, sort of like a preliminary rulemaking, saying here's, what, here's the direction we think we want to go. We want to go to an independent private company, uh, to private non-for-profit, to manage these functions, to coordinate and manage the functions. And the functions were allocations of number blocks, not the actual allocations to the individual, but the blocks to the regional registries. Run the root name server, or not run the servers, but Make, make the edits in the, the file which it indicates what top-level domains exist. Decide on when new top-level domains should exist and coordinate the technical parameters. Same set of functions that we talked about before. So this is the IANA functions and the green paper said, here are the ones that we want to move out for this. Uh, all of the IANA, but nothing more. There's no internet governance here, it is simply the IANA. A lot of comments. Later on, after get reading those comments, the Department of Commerce came up with a white paper, which is the rulemaking, which is actually saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do. This is our policy. We're going to set up a private company. Oh, we're not gonna set it up. We're gonna invite, invite people to come up with a proposal for a private company to allocate IP addresses, uh, run the root server, or manage the root server system, decide when new TLDs, and technical parameters. Same functions. That's all. It's nothing more, nothing less. So when that white paper showed up, a bunch of groups decided to go off and try and figure out what that meant. Uh, this is a picture from a Geneva self-appointed meeting uh, from the International Forum on the White Paper. And down in the lower left-hand corner there, uh, I think that's Jonathan Zittrain, because as was mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, Berkman Center was involved in that. They coordinated that meeting. I went to that meeting, and it was very clear that the people at that meeting, there was thousands of them, maybe not thousands at that meeting, but certainly many hundreds at that meeting, they weren't there for coordinating IP addresses and domain names 
and technical parameters. They were there for internet governance. But that's not what was on the table. Had one person got up at the mic and said, we shouldn't be spending all this time worrying about country code top level domains because the internet is going to destroy countries and we won't have countries anymore. That's the mindset of the people that went to this. They wanted something different. The internet at that time was another universe and another universe where we could start anew. Civilization could start anew. It didn't happen, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, they wanted internet governance by the people or something like that. Most of us thought that that was a well-needed vacuum. We didn't need internet governance. The lack of internet governance was a positive, not a negative. But these people were out there trying to come up with an, a new organization that would control the, govern the internet. John produced a proposal for ICANN, that's Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. He submitted it on October 2nd of 1998. 14 days later, he died. Um, complications of heart, heart surgery, I believe. Uh, four days later, the Department of Commerce said that they would uh, accept his proposal to create, for, to bless this, this organization. Um, Six days later, the ICANN had its first board meetings. It hadn't been incorporated yet, but they had the first board meeting. It was a closed meeting. And unfortunately, that forecast a lot of what the ICANN did. It was a very closed organization, not particularly welcoming of input from elsewhere. Um, but it was incorporated, and by the end of November, uh, Department of Commerce and ICANN signed a 10-year memorandum of understanding. And the memorandum of understanding said, you're going to do the IANA functions. You're going to do, they call it DNS management functions, but they're really the IANA functions. IP number blocks, root server system, new, decide when new top level domains, and technical parameters. Same set of things. No internet governance, just those technical functions. If you translate the, the uh, MOU into what actually happened, the, I, the Department of Commerce is over ICANN, or was over ICANN. But the only thing they did was say yes or no to changes to the file which defines the top level domains. And they'd actually never said no. They just was a bookkeeping function where ICANN would say this is the, cha the changes we want to make, send that off to Department of Commerce, Department of Commerce would look at it and send it back saying okay, but all it was is a list of top-level domains and IP addresses of those servers that deal with each of those top-level domains. That's the entirety of the control the U.S. government had over ICANN. Now, they also could come in and slap them around if they got too capricious, which they did frequently. And Department of Commerce would occasionally come in and say, you really shouldn't be doing that. You're not open enough and what, and what like. And ICANN would say, oh, yeah, we'll be doing much better and then proceed to keep going the way they were. Uh, so, but that's the entirety of the control, was to check off on whether the changes to the zone, root zone file were, were, were okay. In theory, the Department of Commerce could have, maybe, said, take Cuba out of that file. Now, they never did that. In theory, they could have done that. But that's, about, that's the most possible, ridiculous thing they could have done. And if they did that, most of the world would have ignored them. Because they know what Cuba's address is, they just plug it back in again. That's not a big deal. So ICANN was formed by John Postel to institutionalize the IANA. Deal with these technical bookkeeping functions. No governments, just technical bookkeeping functions. John expected that the, I IANA would, the ICANN would decide on new top-level domains, but not many of them. There's a few. Um, he thought maybe 130 a year for the first year and then 30 or so a year after that. Has to deal with I, trademark issues because domain names are trademark issues. Whether they should be or not is irrelevant. And ICANN's worries about the security and stability of the domain name system. 
So ICANN was formed as a little organization to replace John Postel and Joyce Reynolds and maybe one or two other people. So a few competent geeks. Here's ICANN's budget. It went from a few million bucks to 130 million bucks. That's an awful lot of money to replace a few competent geeks. Top level domains. They just suddenly decided that more is better and we auctioned off a thousand top level domains. Didn't gain anything other than confusion. Most of them didn't succeed in the marketplace. Most of them have failed or are close to failing. Some of them are vanity ones, dot .ford. Uh, they're vanity ones and they're, they're not going to go anywhere because they're only for the individual company. And here's another statistic. I can't buy laws. Uh, it went from uh, about 7,000 words to about 30, 37,000 words. If you need 37,000 words to say what you're doing, there's something intrinsically wrong because that ain't the vision John had. This is not technical parameters, it's something else. Now, I'm not talking about a lot of things. I'm not talking about the IGF or the ITU trying to muscle in and the WISIS and other things like that. And also really not going to talk about much the ICANN public goodwill because they started out with a lot of goodwill and blew it away almost entirely, which was really unfortunate. But after ICANN got set up and running, the world started to change. The world started to change a lot. And that was because there still wasn't any internet governance. And the internet was affecting too many people. The Arab Spring was all, a lot of that came out of the, the communications from the internet. The many governments see the internet as an intrinsic threat because it's providing as a, a fellow from China once told me, information that confuses the citizens, i.e. information that the government didn't provide. So the internet's a big deal. It covers a billion people and governments want to control it. So for many, many years, the US was able to go in and say, don't you worry about that. We may be a dictator, but we're a benevolent dictator. We're out for everybody's good. And then Snowden showed up. And that was proven not exactly what it, the real world was. Real world was something different than we're out there for everybody's good. And that blew away the US's primary authority to try and forestall changes to the internet governance structure. Uh, the people wanted to move it outside of the US, move it into the ITU or someplace like that. Um, the, uh, the, I, the internet leadership, technical leadership, that's the inter IETF, the IAB, the regional registries, IP registries, the internet society, W3C, they all got together, they get together regularly, they call themselves the I-Star, and they got together in Montevideo in uh, 2013 and issued a statement which basically said, it's time for the US to let go. And then later on, the Brazilian government and others came up with their own concept, the Net Mundial, it was a concept of, we'll take it over. It was a perpetually appointed 25 member team to take over internet governance. Well, there's nothing to take over but to create internet governance, I guess. Now things began to get really interesting because the US said, well, maybe. Maybe we will let go. There's only this little thumb we've got on the wheel, which is checking the, t the, the uh, top level domain file, but maybe we'll let go. If there's a way that the community could come up with a plan for us to let go and that ICANN or some other organization can, do, can deal with this uh, in a controlled way and, and continue. So they wanted one proposal to transition the IANA to some new environment. Uh, it had to support uh, multi-stakeholder, which means it could not be just governments. It couldn't be just industry. It couldn't be just ISPs. It had to be multi-stakeholder. It had to maintain the security, st stability, and resilience of the internet and meet the, the 
demands of the IANIS customers, which is the regional registries, the IETF, uh, and the domain name world. And unfortunately they said, and maintain the openness of the internet. Well, the ICANN doesn't have any role in the openness of the internet. The openness of the internet is a local function of an ISP in a particular country at a particular time. But the US government put in their statement of what this new organization had to be was to maintain the openness of the internet. It, it doesn't make any sense because the is, there isn't anything that does it today. And there wasn't anything then. So what do you do? Well, there were a bunch of proposals. He, they, a bunch of people, they, they specifically said, this is a list of folks that have to be involved, the folks who are the customers of the IANA, of the IANA plus VeriSign because they run the TLD, they run, they actually edit the TLD file. Um, other global stakeholders, things like that. And they said they would not accept a proposal which was intergovernmental. So you couldn't move it to the ITU. ITU being a government-based organization. The decisions are made by government representatives. And the, and the NTIA said, we're not going to let you do that. That's not a permitted thing. You've got to have it so that it's multi-stakeholder. Um, but who's going to tell, who's going to slap ICANN around when they get, mess, when they get messy? The, I, the uh, Department of Commerce theoretically did that, but didn't really. Uh, so somebody really should do that, be able to do that if com commerce moves out of the picture. So they came up with a way. They come on a community process. And the community process, which has been signed on by ICANN, is incredibly strong. That community process can, can veto changes to the bylaws, can approve changes to the bylaws, can remove individual trustees, can remove the entire board. Uh, it can really do can really nuke the place. Uh, it's a long slog to get there, but you can actually do that. So a very powerful uh, accountability process. Then, um, oh, I keep changing it, but, so I, uh, INTI looked at the proposal that came in and said, okay, it meets the requirements. Now, I've, four times I've made this so that the NTIA, NTIA logo is grayed out. And, he, and Microsoft keeps helping me by bringing it back because I probably didn't really mean that, I guess. So anyway, meanwhile, folks in the, in the Congress got all bent out of shape because the, inter, the U.S. was giving away the Internet. And we were going to give away our freedom, uh, all that kind of stuff. The uh, Congress blocked the NTIA from acting, uh, said, Here's a block, a, a funding block to, to, to the end of our fiscal year. So, or at the end of the yeah, end of the fiscal year, you can't do anything. You can't spend any money to cause a transaction, a transition. Um, the IANA contract was extended to September 30th, 2016. The block from Congress was September 30th, 2016. But Congress just went nuts. There were a pile of people in Congress just went nuts. We can't possibly do that. It's all those headlines at the beginning. We can't do this because we're giving away the internet. And our freedoms are just going to get expunged. The First Amendment rights on the internet are going to go away. All malarkey, but it's all, it was very strong. It's a done deal. Uh, it's September 30th, came and went. The uh, funding block blo expired, so I can't, it's INTIA could spend money again. Uh, the contract, the IANA contract expired. So on October 1st, 2016, we have an independent IANA, which is now, it's part of ICANN, but it's an independent IANA. It's under the community. It's not under the gov US government anymore. Can't be undone. This was a contract that expired. Even the president, the incoming president, can't unexpire a contract which has already expired. Now, could throw, it, throw the FCC at it, say, well, we're in charge of IP addresses. Well, that's only in the US. It's not clear that anything else could happen. Of course, some of the folks like Ted Cruz may try and do something, but it's not clear that they can do anything. This is a done deal. Um, and note that the very thing that they were most worried about is that the UN or countries would take over, Russia and China would take over governance of the internet even though there wasn't any governance in the internet, they would take it over. 
um, would have much been much more likely if the NTIA had not let go. Because the UN had been already been asked to vote to take it over. And if the UN votes to take it over, the countries, in the, the countries of the world vote, either in the UN or in the ITU, to take it over, then how's the US going to say no? The US is now a minority player in the, in the internet. There are many, many, many more people on the internet outside the US than inside. So it's an almost irrelevant player. So much more likely that if, the, if they had stopped the NTIA, that the very result that they feared would come true. So remember, this is technical functions. It's the IANA, at protocol parameters, address blocks, root, root zone file, new top level domains. Coordinated functions, not governance. There ain't no governance here. These are critical functions. They have to work, but they aren't governance. It's what the IANA doesn't do, which is important. It doesn't do governance. There is no internet governance. The internet is so damn important. It's trillions of dollars a year. It's billions of people. How can it not be governed? It's the only international anything that isn't. Telephone system, the, the, uh, the, the shipping on the, on, the, on the oceans, the radios, the satellites, all of those are governed. The internet's not governed. How can that possibly be? Well, it was because nobody cared for long enough that it got away from them. If they had cared in the beginning, if they had been a little bit more concerned with what it was going to bring to them, then they might have imposed governance early on. But they didn't. So there is no internet governance. But is that a problem we have to fix? So we'll, we'll here. Use the microphone for the people out there in audio land. Thank you. Sure. Uh, David Belson, uh, work at Akamai. I'm the editor of the State of the Internet report that we publish. Um, who, under whose authority do the RIRs operate? So are they, I, I know they're independent. I know at least uh, Aaron is an independent corporation. Um, yeah, all, all of the RIRs are independent. But do they, is there any sort of oversight or they're just no, they, themselves? They, when the, the, uh, John, when he first started out, was assigning addresses directly. As I said, I got my addresses for Harvard directly from John. But uh, some folks in Europe came to him and said, you know, let's make this thing easier for you. We'll take care of Europe. You give us a big block of addresses and we will assign them loan. So John blessed uh, Ripe being set up. Okay. Then he blessed um, AP Nick being set up in the Asia Pacific area. In the U.S., he had blessed uh, Net Network Solutions as the source of that. Uh, Network Solutions at some point decided that their, their future was the domain names, and the IP addresses were getting in the way. So they wanted to spin that out. They spun that out as Aaron. That went all the way through the U.S. government, the, the um, Network Resource Council, the federal, federal councils in the U.S., which blessed the idea of spinning it out without ever questioning whether there was an authority to assign addresses. And so that's an open question. There's, there has been threats to sue all of our, or many of the RRs, I don't know whether all of them, there's now five, uh, over whether they have authority to do what they're doing. But the way they've all been set up, uh, when ICANN came in, they were all, they were all re remodeled so that every one of them has a separate policy development process. Right that is completely open to everybody. You can go participate in Aaron's policy development process even though you're not getting any addresses from Aaron. You, you can do it if you're, if you're in Europe, you can participate. Um, they, there's a bottoms up policy development process which is the policy for assigning addresses out of Aaron. Same thing for RIPE, same thing for APNIC and, and, and LATNIC and, and, uh, and AFRINIC. So they're, they're operating under originally John's delegation and never been challenged. Cool. Thank you. Okay, I can understand people's feelings that somebody must be running things. Uh, but I still find the internet too, too centralized with the central source of names and addresses. Where's research being done or an effort to have a much more distributed or decentralized internet? Uh, there's, there's been a lot of 
thinking, think research about this, particularly in the DNS area, for a long time. There have been proposals to have, ever since ICANN was first formed, actually, there are proposals to have some kind of distributed uh, maintenance of the TLDs. But it always comes down to you getting the same Ford.com as I get. Uh, and you, if, if, it, if you, even if it was distributed in the, some kind of um, semaphore-based creation of two TLDs, you still have to coordinate the, you still have to centralize or at least distribute that mapping. So there's, there's a lot of thinking about it. Um, a lot of people would prefer to have geographic addressing to get away from address space issues, uh, so from centralized address space. But a lot of things have just not been proven out. Uh, some people are very serious about the geographic addressing. But it turns out the connectivity in the telephone world, you, if you're offering telephone service, you have to interconnect at all of the peripheries. You have to interconnect at the local offices. There's no requirement in the, uh, in the internet. So when, when I was first start, had my connectivity at home in Cambridge, connecting to Harvard through my ISP, connecting to Harvard, went through Washington, D.C., because that was the closest connection. If we'd had geographic addressing, everything up and down the East Coast would have to know where my house was. And that doesn't scale. So there's a lot of thinking about it, but so far they haven't come up with an alternative. Though they're, they're, not, they're, they're not stopping thinking. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Paula Villarreal. I'm a fellow here at the Bergman Center. Um, you mentioned the incoming president. And do you think uh, this poses an, a possible scenario of the U.S. becoming more like China in terms of internet, like uh, with all this cybersecurity um, talk and all that? It's certainly possible. Um, the way Trump signed on to the, the Cruz issues with uh, IANA seemed to be sort of capricious. Cruz mentioned it and Trump just picked it up. It, it didn't seem like there was any deep thinking involved in that. The, uh, the security issue is a big one. The, these recent attacks, the denial of service attacks from the Internet of Things stuff, those, those are very real. And then certainly the, the, the gut reaction is to fix that. And you fix that by protecting us somehow, uh, rather than looking at the root cause, which is crappy, crappy equipment. Um, so the, the quick reactions would, would tend toward trying to do that. China is this very special case. There are there are a few other countries as well, but um, how China impo how China deals does this thing is all it, connections in and out of China have to go through a China owned connection. That's not the case in most countries. Most countries um, have multiple service providers. They have separate inter interconnections, uh, and they don't have the control point that uh, China does. Um, but certainly. England is now imposing a, um, a, a monitoring rule and a net nanny rule, which is very, very, very strict that all ISPs operating in India and England have to obey. So um, we're, we're on a cusp of perhaps doing that. We're moving back towards what the telephone world was, which is a, a, a Westphalian model of every country as its own fiefdom. Um, that's the internet avoided that, but well, the regulation may move us more to that. Though it tend more likely to be Europe, North America kind of thing rather than individual countries. Hi, uh, this is Jay Carlson, Nop.com. Uh, there are a couple other things that the internet seems like it needs global, at least near global agreement on, and we've seen those in the issues of buffer bloat and the related issue of congestion control. And it, I'm not sure how these are handled except through sort of the Usenet model where peer, is the, peer pressure is the only real control that people have, that you recursively throw people off unless they obey. And that's also another model that IANA could have taken. Well, throw people off is kind of a different, difficult issue. IANA doesn't have any contracts or agreements with individual internet service providers, or individual, like for Harvard. Harvard's an internet service provider for its community. IANA doesn't have any contract with Harvard. Um, the particular issue you mentioned, buffer bloat, it's a technical issue. It's a real one. 
um, but it mostly affects the people that have it rather than just the general o overall. The Internet of Things, these uh, denial of service attacks from crappy equipment, that's a much more serious thing because it does, it does affect a lot of folks uh, and has potential affecting us all. Uh, whether that's done by a central coordination, um, it's certainly not within the purview of IANA today. It could be, and certainly that's the kind of thing that a ITU would worry about. Uh, but what would you do about it? Would you say that um, giving the power to a local regulator to tell ISPs within a country that they have to kick people off whose uh, security camera isn't properly configured? Uh, that's certainly not something that's going to happen from the center. It'd have to be very distributed and it's very unlikely. Uh, the peer pressure thing is the only thing that's there now and it doesn't work. I, I guess I have the microphone so I get to speak. I want to go back to your previous discussion about countries effectively partitioning the Ethernet the way China and Iran is doing. But Russia seems to be taking just the opposite approach, that they have lots of connections into them. And one of the theories behind that is they don't want anyone else to have the ability to shut them off because they're afraid that people will blame them for all these hacking incidents and then cut them off. Why, why would they blame Russia for the hacking uh, incidents? But on the other hand, there have been some private groups, some would call them terrorist groups, that just cut off cables in the Persian Gulf to Egypt, for example, to try to shut, the, shut it down when they didn't want it but other groups that are like ISIS that are launching attacks from their areas. So it looks like there are these things outside of what governance organizations, vigilantism, that tend to come into play when things get really out of hand with distributed denial of service attacks, botnets, and other things doing harm. And how do we ever control that? Well, it's a great question to ask, and it's not clear there's an answer. Uh, yes, there's the vigilantism is a real issue. Uh, the question of whether the <coughs> Egypt cables were, it wasn't Egypt's cables, but the cables off Egypt were cut on purpose or just a trawler doing, being stupid, not determined, but it could be either, it could have been either. Um, we know that countries spy on other countries by using the undersea cables. Um, but there's a, whether you have a court, it's not clear how you can have a coordinated thing other than intergovernmental. And I think that cure would be far worse than the disease. Rich Boroff, Harvard Extension School. With the uh, growth of IPv6 usage and the explosion of uh, numbers that have to be assigned and, and distributed in management. What changes do you see in this this um, organizational structure coming out of that? I know DNS can handle IPv6, but there's a lot more address spaces to be given out. The, the DNS is one of the huge successes because it is completely distributed, operationally distributed. Yes, there's a central, there's a route which says point, points to various different levels down but it's completely decentralized. So it scales extremely well. So I've got, I've run my own piece of DNS at home for my own, for my own sobco.com. Harvard runs a piece, Harvard delegates a piece over to Dana-Farber for their subdomain. So as far as the scaling goes, it's not a real issue. Um, it's, it's the number of addresses in V6, yeah, it's big, but we're not seeing any issues at all with that kind of scaling. We have some scaling with the routing system. Um, unless we can get more hierarchy in the routing system, these routers get bigger and bigger and more and more expensive. The backbone routers, they're million, ball, million dollar boxes now when we thought that would never happen when we were first doing this stuff. Uh, but that's the scale of the routing table these days. And that's not, that, that is a real issue. Uh, it's not clear how to, how to push, that, push back on that. That was one of the things that I would have liked to address when we did v6. Um, we wanted to look at the routing infrastructure, see whether there's a better way to do routing, and we punted on it, and that, I think, was a mistake. But I think we're out of time now, according to the clock on the wall. Yeah, uh, well, I'll do one, one last question. Um, 
So, so you, uh, you mentioned that ICANN sort of has a spotty history of transparency, and then you talked about the various accountability reforms. I was wondering, you know, looking forward, if you could talk about whether you're optimistic or pessimistic about the role that ICANN is going to play, you know, with respect to the broader internet, you know, community of stakeholders and, you know, how you see them playing nicely or not and the opportunity for sort of improving on uh, their past track record. I'm not sure that it's relevant. As I described that the functions we need out of I, uh, IANA, ICANN functions, are not governance functions. The only thing that's remotely like a governance function is coming up with new TLDs. And they've already blown that. A thousand new TLD, TLDs just means .com is valuable and nothing else is. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's relevant. Uh, they've, the IANA has never interfered with the assignment of protocols or with this address assignment, with V6, as Rich pointed out. V6, each of the re registries got a big block of V6 addresses. Some of them may never go back to IANA for another block because the, si the size of the block they got the first time was so big. So there's no opportunity to enforce on anything. Uh, and protocol parameters, they don't, domain name system is about the only, the only thing they got left. So even if they are completely wacko, and transparent and spend and move their budget up to $250 million. All that just means is more people are tithed to pay for it, not that it gets in the way of anything. Great. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming.